John chapter 1, and we'll look at verse 29. John's out baptizing, and up walks Jesus. And the next day, John seeth Jesus coming unto him, and saith, Behold, the Lamb of God. Now, in, in a Jewish mindset, they knew exactly what he meant. Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. I want to read you a story today about a lamb. Go with me over to Second Samuel. Second Samuel, chapter 12, and we'll read the first six or so verses. Second Samuel, chapter 12, <clears throat> verse 1 says, And the Lord sent Nathan unto David. And he came unto him and said unto him, There were two men in one city, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had exceeding many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing save one little ewe lamb, which he had brought and nourished up and grew up together with him, with his children. It did eat of his own meat and drank of his own cup. Think about that. Lay in his bosom and was unto him as a daughter. Tommy, give me just a little bit on this. I'm muffled behind me. And was unto him as a daughter. Thank you. And there came a traveler unto the rich man. And he spared the take of his own flock and of his own herd to dress for the wayfaring man that was come unto him. But took the poor man's lamb, his only lamb, took the poor man's lamb and dressed it for the man that was come to him. David's anger, as he heard this story, David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. And he said to Nathan, As the Lord liveth, the man that hath done this thing shall surely die. And he shall restore the lamb fourfold, because he did this thing, and because he had no pity. Let's pray. Father, I thank you this morning for the Lamb of God. I thank you. Jesus is the Lamb. That taketh away the sins of the world. And I thank you that he took my sins away. And everybody who's had your sins taken away by the Lamb, say amen. Amen. We pick this story up about David. This is, at this point in David's life, this is not the same David that first showed up in your Bible. The first David we see is a young man. He's tender. He's in love with all of his heart to the God that he serves. He would worship God. He would dance before God. He was after God's heart. He would ride under the anointing of God's songs to sing for Israel. But this is not the same David when Nathan comes on the scene. Now it's later in David's life. David's now a powerful king. He has everything at his disposal. He's got it all. Got everything but a heart for God now. David, when Nathan walks in, the story goes, David had committed adultery with Bathsheba, Uriah's wife. Bathsheba turns up pregnant. So David has Uriah killed to cover his sin. And he's setting up on his throne, done killed a man, done committed adultery, and his face is set like a flint. Ain't nothing wrong with me. I'm still God's man, but his Passion for God is gone. He's full of sin. He's lied. He's murdered. He's covered his sins. He thinks he's got his story covered. And everything's okay. I'm still God's king. I'm still God's man. But God had something to say about it. And God whispered in the ear of Nathan the prophet, He said, I want you to go on down to David. And he told Nathan everything that David had done. He said, you go down and you tell David, I'm going to deal with him. Today, I'm going to deal with him. So I can see Nathan, the prophet. It wasn't Nathan that anointed David king. It was Samuel 
Nathan came on after Samuel. And Nathan's probably a little apprehensive because even though he has that relationship with the nation of Israel and the king, it ain't all that much of a personal relationship with David. And so Nathan heads down toward David to break the word of God on him. He knows David ain't going to enjoy hearing what he's got to say. And in his mind, he's probably thinking, how in the world am I going to put this on Nathan? How, I mean, on David, how am I going to walk up into the king's throne room and hit him between the eyes with this? He says, I, I, I need something. Nathan must have been talking to himself. I need something that'll touch his heart. I can't just walk in and point my finger at him. I got, I got to, I got to touch his heart and he, he's hard right now. He's a hard man. He's gotten away from his relationship with God. But maybe if I can touch his heart, there'll be just a little spark for God still left in his heart. And maybe I can get through to him. And they, and Nathan says, I know what I'll do. I'll tell him a story about a shepherd. Because he was a shepherd, and, and, and maybe when I tell him a story about a shepherd, that'll take him back to before he was a king. When he had nothing, he was a shepherd. And he loved his lambs, and he loved his God. Nathan walks up to the palace. He don't have an appointment. He don't have a right to go in to see the king that day. David's busy conducting the business of the kingdom. They tell David that Nathan the prophet's outside. And out of respect for... David still had enough respect for the prophets of God. He allows Nathan to come in. Nathan says, David, I want to tell you a story. David said, well, I'd like to hear it. Nathan says, David, there was this rich man... He had exceeding flocks. He had herds. He had shepherds that worked for him. This man lived in luxury. Shepherds on the payroll. Thousands of sheep. Had a name in the the city. Had prestige. He was popular. He had wealth. Had women, clothes, and wine galore. David leans in and listens a little harder Because this man's life is sounding a lot like his. And he can equate to how this rich man is being described. In 2 Samuel chapter 8, your Bible says that David got himself a name. David had a name. He was like this rich man. Uh, uh, At the school, at the schoolhouse, they'd tell the kids stories about their great king. He was famous. He, uh, He was Israel's sweetheart. They even wrote songs about David. And they were singing songs about David all through Israel. You know what the song was? Saul has slain his thousands, but David has slain his tens of thousands. David was very popular. Probably, I don't know, but if you could go back to the day and look at at the the, the most popular baby names, there was probably a lot of little baby boys being named David after King David. David had it all. Nathan continues with this story. I'm not going to be long today. I'm going to be brief. I want you to see that lamb, before we leave today. Nathan continues with his story, and he said, David, in the same city with this rich man, there's a poor man. He lived in insufficiency every day. His was a hand-to-mouth existence. Only scarcity. Only poverty. Only lack. His kids lived in a home where they learned and knew how to do without. Anybody ever been there? This poor man, David, was unknown in the city. He had no honor with the city fathers. He was unimportant. David, there was this rich man that had all these sheep. There was this poor man that had one little lamb. But this poor man and this rich man who never seen each other, their lives collided in one day. A traveler came to the rich man. The rich man thought, I need to provide him a feast. I need to really provide him something nice. So he sends his servants over to the poor man's house and grabs the poor man's only lamb. Kills it, dresses it, feeds it to the traveler, feeds it to his friend, and never considers that he had taken the poor man's only lamb. Now just in case you're dull of hearing and understanding and you haven't picked up yet the moral of this story, the lamb is the lamb of God. Jesus Christ. Uh, Abraham told Isaac, his son, when God told him to take him up 
and sacrificed him. And Isaac looked around and he said, Father, I see the wood. I see the fire. I see that big knife in your hand. But I don't see a lamb. And Abraham prophetically said to his son, God shall provide himself a sacrifice. Thank God for the Lamb of God. Thank God for the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Thank God. It, 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 it was in Exodus where they were told, listen, everything has to be redeemed with a lamb. If, if the firstborn son is born, you got to kill a lamb and redeem him to get him sanctified. If a donkey has the first child a donkey had, firstborn male donkey, you got to kill a lamb to, to sanctify that donkey. And if you don't kill a lamb for that donkey, you got to break his neck. You think, why was all that in the Old Testament? Because God was foretelling and, 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 and foreshadowing how He would send His only begotten Son who was the Lamb of God that would take away the sins of the world. Can you see the Lamb of God that day that He entered into Jerusalem riding on a donkey? A donkey had to have a lamb sacrificed to redeem it. And here was the Lamb of God rode in the town on a donkey. He was the, Listen, what was he saying? He was the Lamb of God that was about to be sacrificed for all of humanity. But your Bible also says that in Romans that the whole creation groaneth waiting for the adoption of the sons of God. He was saying, here I come. I'm the Lamb of God. I'm about to be sacrificed. I'm about to shed my blood. And every man, every woman that wants to believe on me can be saved. And he reached down and whispered to that donkey and he said, and the adoption of the sons of God will take place and I'm going to jerk the curse off of all the animals, off of all the creation. What a sight that would have been that day to have seen the Lamb of God riding a donkey. This poor man had no property. He had no prestige. He had no respect. He had nothing to give his family. But he had a lamb. If he couldn't give his family all that he wished to give them, Barry, he could give them a relationship with the lamb. Because he had a lamb. And his family had a relationship with the Lamb. If you can lead your family into a relationship with the Lamb, if you can get your family to bond with the Lamb, is anybody with me today? If the Lamb can become important in your house, then the Lamb is greater than any inheritance you can leave them. The lamb is greater than any position you can stick them in in life. The lamb is greater than any business you can pass off to them. The lamb is greater, and I'm all for education, but the lamb of God is greater than any education you can afford to buy your family. As a man of God, as a woman of God, listen to what I'm saying. Nothing that you can do more will affect your family after you're gone than if you set them up and taught them how to have a relationship with the lamb that lives in your house. Are you teaching your family how to have a relationship with the Lamb? No matter what, no matter, listen, no matter what you achieve in your life. If your whole family looks at you and says, you're the, you're the one that's the failure in the family. If you've got a house that has a Lamb, and your family's in relationship with the Lamb, Norvis, you are a success. You can't, you can't be any more successful than for your family to be in relationship with the sacrificial lamb that's in your house. Aren't you glad you got a lamb living in your house? Oh, I'm glad I got a lamb living in my house. Now, let me look at some things about a relationship with the lamb. This story of the poor man. Your Bible says that this lamb grew up with his children. This was the family pet. They kept this lamb in the house. Now, a Jewish house wasn't a big thing like, like you guys in two and three thousand square foot house. A Jewish house was a maybe what, higher, maybe a two room sleeping quarters and a 
front room, just, just a little something. And, 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 and this lamb lived with his family, it grew up with his children. Let me tell you something. We don't, you, you don't need, it's not enough for you. You can't survive with just a Sunday morning lamb. I said, whole lot more than y'all amen to me for. They had that lamb in the house all day long, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. If you just come to church on Sunday and pet the lamb like you had a petting zoo, then you go home the rest of the week, you ain't got much of a lamb. Deuteronomy chapter, uh, chapter 6 and, and verse 7 and verse 6 says, And these words which I command you shall be in your heart. Let me tell you something. When you get the Bible shut up in your bones, you'll be like the prophet when he got discouraged and said, I'm going to give up. I just backslide. I ain't preaching no more. And he said, I couldn't help myself. Said his word was like fire shut up in my bones if you ain't got enough in the word to where it's got down in your spirit i pity you you need to take some time sit on the porch in the den or somewhere and read your bible to that stuff starts to burn on the inside of you he said he said in that watch this i'm talking about keep the lamb in the house you ain't sunday morning lamb you'll teach them to your children you'll talk of them when you sit in the house when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise up, he said, this ain't a Sunday morning lamb. This lamb needs to be on your mind. Your children need to, you need to talk about the lamb to your children when you're sitting in your house instead of the whole conversation being around the Clemson Tigers and the Carolina game call. Every once in a while, you need to break down and talk to your kids about Jesus. When you lay down at night, the lamb needs to be in the house. The last thing you talk about to your kids should be the lamb. When they wake up in the morning, you need to tell them, Hey guys, this is the day that the Lord has made. We're going to rejoice and be glad in it. God's blessings on us today. That lamb grew up with them in their house. He did it said, Nathan said to David, said, That lamb ate of their own bread. He, he was at the table. He was in the house. The lamb was at the table eating with them. I can see them. They all got a chair around the table. There's daddy, there's mama, there's junior, there's sis, there's sis junior, and there's the lamb sitting at the table. Had a chair for the lamb. You, what, 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 would it do, what would it do to you if at your house... When your family sat down to eat, you had an empty chair sitting there, and you said, that's Jesus' chair. And, and, and you was conscientious that Jesus was sitting there. It might change your conversation. It might change how you talk to each other. It might change some of them slang words you use. The lamb was at the table. And, and listen, this next one, I mean, I love animals. Y'all know I had a little puppy dog, 15 years. He disappeared, and I loved him, and it broke my little heart when he was gone. But it says in that story there, it says, if you remember, it says, this lamb, for the poor man, said it drank of his cup. I love my little doggy mister, but he ain't never drank out of my cup. <laughs> it, they didn't have a daddy cup, a mama cup. A junior cup. They had one cup. And I can see dad take a drink, pass it to mama, pass it to junior. Junior holds it out to that lamb and that big old tongue comes out. (laughs) What in the world is that about? They were eating at the same table the lamb ate at. They were drinking at the same table that the lamb drank from. And Jesus, the lamb of God later, would say, take this bread and eat it. This is my body, which is broken for you. And take this cup and drink it. This is my blood, 
which is shed for you. God was giving us a beautiful picture of the Lamb at the table of God. Whether you realize it or not, we're seated at the table with the Lamb of God. And we take His body and we eat it and we take His blood and we drink it and we're saved and we're healed and we're whole. And I wish anybody that's ever experienced that would take five seconds and just love on the Lamb for a minute. Love on the Lamb. Love on the Lamb. This Lamb was a part of their family. This poor man's family. They could feel this Lamb. As I said earlier, they just didn't go and pet him on a Sunday morning, pet and zoo, and live the rest of their life all week long without the Lamb. The Lamb was there, baby. And... He was in the house. I said, the lamb was in the house all week long. Every meal, the lamb was there. Every conversation, the lamb was listening. The old timers used to sing, and he walks with me, and he talks with me. The family loved this lamb. Maybe today, You can't give the luxuries of life to your family. But if you get them in love with the Lamb, no matter what you do for your family, they can't miss loving the Lamb. Now, let me talk to you about this. A Jewish house built a small small dwelling. You can't pull a lamb up in a house and keep him in a house. And the house not smell like a lamb. You walk into, I've walked in some houses and they smell like a, if you got a house that smells like a cat, get rid of your cat. (laughs) How many, let me see in here, I ain't even preaching now, I'm meddling. How many people have a cat that live in the house? Right, don't be ashamed, you got a cat. Nobody's got a cat. God, you got a cat? You got a cat? Get rid of y'all's cats. <laughs> I don't want to offend y'all, but I'm just going to tell you, I am not a cat person. As a matter of fact, I hate a cat. A cat's just like your ex-wife. You can be petting a cat. Just petting that cat, and the first thing you know... <laughs> <laughs> uh, hallelujah. <laughs> if you keep a lamb in the house, the whole house is going to smell like the lamb. I said, the atmosphere in the house smelled like the lamb. I said, the atmosphere in the house smelled like the lamb. And I want a house that when you walk up in my house, you can smell the oil of God. You can tell that the anointing is in the house. I don't want a house when you walk in, you feel demons in it, you feel all kind of mess on TV, you feel all kind of mess being said. I want a house that when you walk in, you can tell that God lives in that house. David said, uh, when will you visit me? Then he said, I'll behave wi-, in Psalms 101, I'll behave wisely in my house, and I'll set no unclean thing before my eyes. Let me tell you something. I've been in some Christian's house and walk in, and they stuff on the TV playing, and I think, oh my God, I'm meddling. I know I'm meddling. I'm preaching old time, but I think, oh my God, how can you be saved and watch somebody get raped on your TV? And how can you be saved and want to watch somebody get murdered on your TV all the time? I don't want to see that stuff. If I know somebody's about to get raped or murdered, I'll change the channel. I don't want to see that. That's from the devil. The devil comes to steal, kill, and destroy. I don't want to entertain myself with what he does. I want to entertain myself with what Jesus comes. He comes to give life and life more abundantly. Your house ought to smell like the lamb, not like a devil. I'm getting in some of y'all's business. Amen. Can I, oh, I better, 
I better not talk about it. If your house smells like smoke, I'll really make somebody mad. That lamb was in the house. Every discussion they had, that lamb heard. They had discussion about, is, are you going to date that person? Are you going to go to that place? Are you going to listen to this? Are you going to drink that? Are you going to smoke this? Are you going to watch that on TV? That lamb was in the house. Listening to all of it. And while they were contemplating their sin, that lamb was rubbing up against them. The very lamb that they loved was in relationship with that would be sacrificed for their sin. They were contemplating. He was there. He was part of the family. This poor man had what David didn't have anymore. A love for the lamb. A relationship with the lamb. This lamb drank from the same cup, ate from the same table. Your Bible says that that lamb lay on the poor man's bosom. I can only see as he fell asleep in his lazy boy in his Jewish house with his big screen TV. High definition. <laughs> Watching an Egyptian movie. <laughs> I can only see <laughs> as he falls asleep that lamb is laying on his bosom Rome he can feel that lamb's heart beating you know the last thing that was on his mind when he went to sleep at night there's a lamb in the house you know, the first thing that was on his mind when he woke up, there's a lamb here with me. Boy, I want to tell you, what victory would you have if the last thing you thought about when you went to sleep was the lamb of God? If the first thing you thought about in the morning was not, what all I got to get gun today, but the lamb's with me. He'll never leave me. He'll never forsake me. That lamb... Lay on his bosom. My little doggy, he weighed four or five pounds. His favorite thing was he would jump up in the lazy boy with me. He'd climb up on me. He would he'd lay right here. And he just wanted to cuddle. He'd put his little nose up next to me. He just wanted to cuddle. And there was a, a wooing. There was a relationship that me and the little doggy had. It was one of love. And you know, it, Norbert, it brought some peace to me. I'd had a bad day. That little, little puppy dog would get up on me. And I'd pet him and he'd just stretch out. How many of y'all know what I'm talking about? You cat people don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> what would it be like to have the lamb in the house and have him lay on your bosom? Do you see the picture? I'm just in love with this lamb. Lamb, I just want to thank you for being here. Lamb of God, I just want to thank you that your blood will cover all my sin. He's my lamb. He's our lamb. He's your lamb. David rose up when he heard the story. Something, indignation in him rose up. and He got mad and he said, tell me who this man is. He's going to die, but before he dies, he's going to pay back fourfold. Be careful. When out of anger, you start to speak stuff on other people. Because you know what happened to David? Four of his sons died. At fourfold. Four of his sons. You want to know their names? I have the names written down. I'm not smart enough to remember, but I can write them. David's four sons died. Bathsheba's son, Ammon, Absalom, and Abinadi. All four of his sons died. You know what? You need to be careful when you pass judgment on somebody. Because with the same judgment you judge, it's being measured back to you. Be careful when you point a finger at somebody that you can live up to what you're condemning them over. 
And don't ever see somebody in the middle of a circumstance and criticize how they react into that circumstance when you haven't been through that circumstance yourself and you don't know how you'd react when you got into the middle of it. David said, this man took a life. He's got to pay back four lives. The problem was David had took a life. And now he was going to get to pay back four lives. Change the story, Passover, that first Passover. The Passover lamb. God was delivering Israel. The only way that's going to be delivered was through the blood of a lamb. He said the death angel is going to pass over. But I, here's what I want you to do. I want you to take a lamb. You don't just grow out, just don't just go out on the night of Passover and indiscriminately grab any lamb and bring him in and kill him. You get a family lamb. And you bring that lamb into your house seven days before Passover. You eat with that lamb. You pet that lamb. You lay that lamb on your bosom. You and your family get attached to that lamb. Because when that lamb has to die, and you see your lamb, Sacrifice. It's your lamb. And you see him sacrificed and his throat cut and his blood shed and his blood applied to the doorpost. And you understand that it's only through the blood of that lamb that you love and you've been in relationship with. It's only through his blood that you're saved. Is Jesus just a historical figure to you? Or is he real? Do you feel what he felt? He felt what you felt. He was touched with the infirmities that you have. Let me read you a scripture. I'm over in Hebrews chapter 13. I'm going to read in verse, no, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm in Hebrews chapter 9. I'm going to read in verse 12 through. Verse 11 says, but Christ, verse 11, but Christ being come a high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood. He entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctified the purifying of the flesh. Look at verse 14. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works? To serve a living God. I'm thankful that there's a lamb. And that our family has a lamb. And I'm thankful that it's by the blood of the lamb that our sins vanish. I'm thankful that our addictions are broken by the blood of the lamb. I'm thankful that it's through the blood of the lamb that heaven is won. I'm thankful that your Bible says that we're overcome by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of His testimony. The Lamb knows who's in relationship with Him. You know how I know the Lamb knows who's in relationship with Him? Because your Bible says in Revelation 22, nobody enters into that city unless your name's written in the Lamb's book of life. Steve. We got to be washed in the blood of the Lamb. You can't do it no other way. You can't religion your way in. You can't good works your way in. You can't hope your way in. There's only one way to the Father, 
And that's by Jesus. And that means you got to accept him crucified for nobody else's sin for your sin. And you got to say, Jesus, wash me of my sin in your blood. And then you know what? It do you good to realize the sacrifice that he paid for you to be saved. This was no easy thing. Jesus was sweating drops of blood, his own blood, when he said, Lord, if this cup can pass from me. He knew he was about to be beat. He knew he was about to be his back broke wide open with a whip. He knew they was about to put a crown of thorns on his head, and his head would swell to two or three times its size, and his eyes would sink back, and they'd pull the beard from him, and while blood was bubbling out of his face, they'd clear their throats and spit on him. He knew they'd take a reed and beat the crown further down on his head. He knew that it would be all he could bear just to get to the cross, and Simon would have to pick up the cross and tote it for him. He knew this was going to be ugly. But yet, he determined to do it before you got here because the Bible says he was the Lamb of God slain before the foundation of the world. In Revelation chapter 5, there's, there's a tense moment in heaven. There's a scroll with seven seals on it, which is the, the book of life. And nobody, nobody can open it. They've got all the angels around the throne. All the elders are around the throne. They can find nobody worthy to open the seals. And heaven kind of comes to a stop. What are we going to do? Nobody can open the seals. And your Bible says that I seen a lamb as it had been slain. I don't know what a slain lamb looks like in heaven, but a, good, I feel the Holy Ghost. A lamb as it had been slain, stepped up before God's throne and took that scroll and loosed the seals so they could read Lisa Hill's been washed in the blood. F.C. Hart's been washed in the blood. Giselle's been washed in the blood. You better thank God that there was a lamb that was slain because without him being slain, let me tell you, nobody would be worthy. Nobody would be able to be saved. There is a lamb for your family. And you need to keep him in your family. Mark, I need some help. There is a lamb for you. Let this pastor make one promise to you. There is nothing that you're facing that the blood of Jesus can't heal. I know this is an old-fashioned sermon, and it's not snazzy and all that stuff, but I'm telling you a truth that will take you. Let me say it again. There is nothing with a capital N, no thing, nothing, that the blood of Jesus can't handle in your life. I came to Jesus. My poor old daddy was praying for me. I was traveling with a rock band. I was addicted. And I tell myself, you're not really addicted. You quit. It wasn't no trouble for me to quit drinking. I quit drinking about 10 times a month. <clears throat> but let me tell you something. When I asked Jesus to save me, and the blood of Jesus touched me, you know what? I didn't wonder was I saved. I didn't hope I was saved. I felt sin come up off of me. I, the blood of Jesus touched me and I felt the chains of addiction fall off of me. I knew that I had been set free. That's why we named this church Set Free. I knew that I had been set free. I knew that my life had changed. I didn't know how it was going to change. I didn't know everything that was going to happen. And I still had a lot of hurdles to jump over. But I'm going to tell you something. I found out later as I walked this thing out that that one drop of Jesus' blood was more than enough for anything I'd face. Nobody preaches the blood of Jesus anymore. But we need to go back and readdress it and put our confidence in the blood of Jesus. There's where we stand on Calvary's bloody hill. Without that blood, we won't make it. But with that blood, we're more than overcomers because we overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. 
My brethren, I write unto you that you sin not. But if you sin, we have an advocate with the Father. And the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. I don't care how long you've been saved or if you've never been saved. What you got in your life, you might be like David. You might have that sin covered and everybody thinks you're cool and you're setting up looking like God's man. But you know in your heart there's something that you need to get covered. That lamb. Look at that lamb. That lamb. A lamb. Jesus shed his blood for you to go free. Hi, my name is Yolanda and I'm a volunteer here at Set Free. Thank you so much for taking the time to watch the sermon video. We want to know what special and exciting things that God is doing in your life. If there's anything we can do to serve you, be in prayer about, or celebrate with you, contact us at 864 269 3620 or at hello at It is because of your generosity that we're able to expand our reach for the kingdom. So if you're blessed by this ministry and would like to donate or learn more, feel free to visit us at setfreecf.com. We pray that you have a blessed week.